Hello and welcome to this edition of Arlington Public News. I'm Michelle Marino. And I'm James Milan, in for Paul Worland. At Arlington Public News, we bring you stories of interest to Arlington and surrounding communities. In tonight's newscast, we continue reporting on business and businesses in Arlington and explore the concerns and issues they face. We have a conversation about fatherhood, masculinity, and race with author and law professor Frank Rudy Cooper, and we introduce a new APN series, Building Arlington's Schools. Plus, a two-sport standout athlete who has a chance to go pro returns home. Arlington native Pat Connaughton talks about both his professional basketball and baseball prospects. All that and more, please stay with us. Arlington joins Nepal and the world in mourning victims of the recent earthquake as the death toll continues to climb. Arlington's Diversity Task Force will be holding a candlelight vigil on Sunday, May 3rd at Town Hall at 7 p.m. for survivors and victims of the earthquake. APN News intern Sarah Weber has a look at the latest relief efforts. On Saturday, April 25th, a 7.4 magnitude earthquake hit the nation of Nepal. More than 5,000 people are reported dead and at least 10,000 injured. The UN has predicted that at least 8 million are affected by the natural disaster overall. The Nepali government is slowly receiving foreign aid, but relief has been hampered due to congestion at Kathmandu's only airport. The tragedy in Nepal has affected people all over the world, including right here in Arlington. Candlelight vigils continue to be held at the Drikung Meditation Center in Arlington to honor those killed in the disaster. Aid groups are also providing support to the recovering nation. UNICEF, Oxfam, and the Red Cross are just three examples of organizations receiving donations for Nepal. For Arlington Public News, I'm Sarah Weber. Arlington's annual town meeting started on Monday, April 27th. In the opening session, Selectman Kevin Greeley gave the State of the Town address, and student exchange visitors from Nagokakyo, Japan, were welcomed. Among the warrant articles discussed and voted on in the first two sessions, Article 6, a zoning bylaw amendment that looked to document zoning reviews and would have affected the town building inspector, was voted no action. And after much discussion and several votes dealing with proposed amendments, the creation of a community preservation committee was approved. For live coverage of town meeting, please tune in to ACMI's government channel or watch live stream on acmi.tv slash gov live. Does everybody understand what Mr. Deist is doing? In the latest segment of APN series spotlighting local merchants, we talk to small business owners about some of their concerns surrounding parking and Arlington's appeal to area shoppers. In this second segment in our series about Arlington businesses, Arlington Public News meet with business owners to talk about their experiences. It's an art and artisan gallery and we have about 100 local artists in, in the gallery itself. There's also um, other goods. We have a little bit of fair trade and we try to keep whatever is not from the local area made in America. People are wonderful. I have to say we've been well supported in the center. People really like having a local shop here and I am very grateful to them for keeping it all going. We have our, our little uh, local business, Arlington Center Business Association, as does the East has their own as well, and we try to come together and brainstorm and plan events and, you know, figure out uh, with some of our local Board of Selectmen, how can we fix some of the problems like the parking? How can we promote our area more? What will bring more consumers to our area? So we, we get together and do that. And then we have the Chamber of Commerce, which works to promote Arlington as a whole, as well as ATEC. ATED is primarily uh, promoting Arlington. They did the little um, kiosk right down at the top of the bike path, uh, you know, with all kinds of information all about Arlington museums and Arlington shops and Arlington restaurants. So there are little things that are coming together that are helping to promote. Parking has been an ongoing issue for business owners in Arlington Center. The corner of the Rougen Theater, the performing art center located on Medford Street, share with us some of his concerns. We're fortunate in some ways because we have the big municipal lot across Medford Street and be behind Arlington Catholic High School. And that lot is free after six o'clock on all day Sunday. So that's an attractive thing for a business such as ours that brings a lot of people into town um, to have. And yet 
the parking lot can fill up many times, and when a, a, a new restaurant opens, which we're very happy about the common ground here, on a busy weekend night, there's less spaces for more people available. So that's something that the town has addressed, and I think in the coming year, certainly one of the things that needs to be done is sprucing up the area. You know, we've started to do some work out here in Broadway Plaza where you have these structures that do nothing but kind of create a place for people to hang out that are just hanging out, not very conducive to families walking through. So part of that's already been started to be changed. Arlington's also um, loosening the restrictions on outdoor seating at restaurants, so you'll see a lot more sidewalk seating which uh, certainly uh, creates a more conducive at atmosphere. There's so much to do to create a more walkable city. And one of the things we're doing on the Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture, considering what we need to do to make Arlington Center a cultural district. For Arlington Public News, this is Yawa Digboe. You know, James, I think there are some fantastic small businesses here in Arlington, and I'm really excited to see you know, how the neighborhood changes and how the business or businesses uh, are really cultivated more. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, I have seen a lot of changes in the area they're talking about just in the 20 years I've been in Arlington. But uh, I think, as Leland said, uh, more needs to be done, and hopefully that will be the case. APN is proud to present a new series, Building Arlington's Schools. For our first program, I sat down with school superintendent Kathleen Bodie to discuss the anticipated renovation of Arlington High School and how the ongoing growth in our student population could present significant challenges in the future. Hello, I'm James Milan. On their accreditation visit to Arlington High School in the spring of 2013, members of the New England Association of Schools and Colleges stated that the low quality of the facilities produced a negative effect on its learning environment. Problems with crowded classrooms, unsafe labs, and dirty hallways have plagued AHS for years, and the continuing growth in our student population threatens to make the situation even worse. This month, the Arlington School Committee and Town of Arlington submitted a plan to the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or MSBA, <clears throat> which issues grants for capital improvements in local public schools about how to best rebuild the school. Joining me to talk about this is Dr. Kathleen Bodie, Superintendent of Arlington Schools. Dr. Bodie, thanks for coming in. My pleasure, Jane. Appreciate it very much. I wanted to first just to ask that open-ended question, why does the high school need to be renovated? It needs renovation almost in every way you can look at it. If you just simply look at it from the point of view of the building, uh, it, it is, represents actually three different buildings built at different times. and the oldest building was built over 100 years ago. All of the, all of the systems in the, in the high school need to be uh, updated or re entirely replaced, and that includes heat, electricity, lighting, plumbing, the roof, um, our boilers. We've re replaced two of them, but two of them, which are the backups for the two that we have replaced, are very, very old. There's virtually nothing in the high school that does not need, at the physical building level, updating. Programmatically, uh, we need to have a renovation uh, because our classrooms, first of all, are too small. If you were to look at the recommendations for classroom sizes from MSBA, only 23% of our classrooms meet the minimum, minimum square footage, which poses a problem when our class sizes are growing, makes classrooms very crowded, but it also poses a, a safety problem in our science labs when you're, when you're having a, a lab experiment and you have too many students in the space that's, uh, that we have. So what do you anticipate student enrollment to be over the course of the next, say, five to ten years? It's growing. That, that we know. In the last uh, three years, we've added 450 students. So it's roughly about a 3% increase each year, which is a, a very rapid rate of increase for a school system. This year's kindergarten is five, over 500. Right now it's 513. And we're seeing that the number of children that are being born in town um, are also increasing. 
which is a compliment to the town. It means a lot of people want to live in Arlington, and I, and I take it as a compliment to the school system as well. Um, our students do perform very, very well. Over the next few weeks, we will further explore the future of Arlington schools and the challenges they face in a new series called Building Arlington's Schools. For Arlington Public News, and on behalf of Dr. Bodie, this is James Milan. Thanks for joining us. For another perspective on education, we bring you this APN Book Club report about Mike Lupica, a prominent sports writer and author of young adult fiction. Lupica recently visited the Audison Middle School to speak about the values of friendship, courage, and loyalty in sports and in life. Sometimes it just happens in sports. Kids of different talent levels, sizes, love for the game, you come together and you're able to do something together that you didn't think you could do. That's what happened with my team. But I said every game you play, every game, you're playing for the championship of any boy or girl who ever got told by an adult that they weren't good enough in sports. In early March, veteran sports writer and best-selling children's book author Mike Lupica visited the Audison Middle School. He captivated the audience of 7th and 8th graders with stories of sports and life and the relationship between them. But I saw for myself how important sports is in your lives. And, and I'll tell you something. Before every game, I'd call them over and I'd say, okay, look up in the stands. See all those adults up there? Every one of them would change places with you and be your age and have one more game to play. There's not a time when I go past the fields or the gyms where I coach my kids where I wouldn't give a bazillion dollars to have one more Friday night or Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon and have one more game to coach. That's how special that time was. My books are written in that spirit. Lupica was moved by a real-life tale of redemption and triumph to make the shift from being a sports reporter to becoming a novelist. I'm writing stories about boys and girls your age trying to do something cool in sports. Every one of you has a novel inside you. If you stood up today and told me about the best day you ever had in sports, or the worst day you ever had, or the best coach, or the worst coach, some memory that you have, I'm just wired this way. Immediately, I'd start thinking of it as a novel. These stories are your stories. The stories I tell are your story. And now here I am with a new book called The Only Game. It's about a boy named Jack Callahan. He's 12 years old. He's the best 12-year-old baseball player in his town. But he's lost his brother under tragic circumstances, and he blames himself even though it was not his fault. And he doesn't say this to his parents or his friends, but to punish himself, he takes away the thing that he loves the most in his life other than his family, and that's baseball. And then the book becomes something about the power of, of redemption and friendship because he's got three amazing friends in this book. He wanted to share his experience and stories with younger students, showing them the true heart of sports. I now write the kind of books that I wanted to read when I was a boy. They're about loyalty, and friendship and teamwork. You know that there's nothing more important than being thought of as a good friend and being able to count on your friends. That, that's what my books are about. Lupica focuses on a younger audience, teaching them how to overcome tough challenges. My wife said to me, are you gonna be happy writing for young readers from now on? And I said, yeah. She said, good, because all the other stuff you've done in your career, you're gonna be remembered best as somebody who helped get kids to want to read. It's the coolest thing that ever happened to me and I'll make you one deal. If you keep reading my books, I'll keep writing them. Thank you very much for coming this here today. This is James Milan with the APN Book Club reporting for Arlington Public News. Up next, news producer Peter Bermudez engages a local law professor in a conversation about the intersection of masculinity and race for young men of color in school and in society. The birth of a child is typically one of a parent's happiest moments, but all too soon thereafter, the questions and concerns often flood in. Is she healthy? Am I up to the task of raising him? Will she do well in school? Can we afford college? But what if the lovely child born unto you faced a mountain of biased and stunting statistics? Not because of who he was as an individual, but due to the society he was born in and the demographic groups he happened to fall into. 
Joining me to lend context to this issue is Frank Rudy Cooper, tenured professor at Suffolk University's Law School. With a scholarly focus on the policing of men of color, he is also the co-editor of the book, Masculinities and the Law, a Multidimensional Approach. Welcome. Frank. Thank you. Pleased to have you. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. You contend that boys and young men of color uh, risk their racial credibility, as it were, mm. by succeeding academically in school. What do you mean by that? You know, I think back to, I grew up here in Cambridge, right next door to Arlington. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went to the public schools and grammar school, I didn't experience much of this, but I got to high school. And one of my first uh, experiences, a semester in, I got an A average. And uh, first, all the teachers in my program came up and said, Frank, great job, great job, way to go, good, good, good. Yeah. And then uh, I had uh, a friend of sorts, uh, a peer a year older than me, come up to me and say, you know, you're being white. What's, what's yeah. going on with you? Um, and that kind of experience is the danger of being seen as either being black or being high achieving. Your son, I think, is in the neighborhood of 11 or so now. Yeah, he just turned 11. Is this something that you have a sense that he's experienced to date? Yeah, a little bit I do. Of course, it's hard to speak uh, for an 11 year old even already. There's <laughs> such, you know, well developed personalities and they have their own sense of their own experience. Right. What I would say is that I observed that my son felt that he was being challenged for speaking up too much in class, for being a know it all, right. um, and that some of that may have been related to race. Uh, that he felt that he was particularly being challenged by other black boys or boys mm. of color. Mm -hmm. I think that people of color often have a hard time knowing how to relate to people of color in this diverse and majority white world. So when I think of kids, you know, what do they make of that if they see that most of the kids that are sort of held out as high achieving are white and then they see this one black boy and really there were many boys of color in his school who were high achieving but a number of them had moved on by the time he had this experience mm. and so mm -hmm. he sort of stood out. Right. And I think the kids, black and white and other, really had a, a hard time knowing what to make of that. It didn't fit their expectations. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. For joining me today. I appreciate it. For Professor Frank Cooper, I'm Peter Bermudez for Arlington Public News. You know, Michelle, there are so many challenges to being a, a, a student. I remember, as you know, I was a teacher for a lot of years, and it's just great to know that there are adults out there who are paying attention to what kids are going through and offering support. Absolutely, and they all seem to have very unique interests, so it's great that there are teachers that want to foster those interests. Indeed. Eric Stenge is an Arlington filmmaker whose work has appeared on PBS and other networks. APN visited with Stangi to find out about his latest documentary on the long and influential career of statesman James Baker. I'm Damon Terbitt for Arlington Public News, and today I'm joined by Arlington resident Eric Stangi. He is a, an award-winning documentary producer, writer, and director. His work has been featured on the BBC, P PBS, and the Discovery Channel. Eric, thank you very much for joining us today. Now, you make a lot of documentaries, obviously. What, what is it about documentaries that you like specifically in terms of film? They involve real storytelling. So most of what I do are hour-long documentaries. That's a, a long period of time to fill. You can really get into the nitty-gritty of a good story. You recently just had one of your um, documentaries on Jim Baker released on PBS uh, last month, I believe. So why don't you tell us a little bit about who Jim Baker was? Uh, James Baker, James A. Baker III is his <laughs> official name and was, is still alive. He's a, a senior statesman, you'd call him. He spent about 12 years in Washington in very influential posts during the 80s and early 90s. What do you want the, the viewers to get from this? Well, we called it James Baker, the man who made Washington work, because we're hoping to point out that there was a time not very long ago when the parties did work together and when officials from both sides could come together, both in a public way and privately behind the scenes. and come to agreements in order to be effective. For example, the 1986 Tax Reform Act. Baker, as Secretary of the Treasury, 
really, it, it was his job to get that through Congress, to come to an agreement, and that was the last time we had effective tax reform in this country. There hasn't been anything like it since, almost, almost 30 years. And uh, that was because Baker went and sat with Danny Rostenkowski, the Democratic chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, and they worked on every little paragraph of the tax code. Yeah, the U.S. tax code's that thick. They <laughs> went through everything, which I think is a sign of the kind of negotiator Baker was. He, he didn't make any, you know, everyone was unhappy right. in the end. Now, you said that you've interviewed, you've interviewed him a few times. What's it like sitting down across from a guy and just getting to ask him whatever you want? He's a real old-fashioned kind of guy. Very polite, uh, very dignified, for lack of a better word. One of the things that people always told us when I asked about why he was so effective as a diplomat is they said that when he walks in a room, everyone turns, everyone notices. And people said that when he walked in, everyone knew he was representing the United States of America. Now, you worked with another Arlington resident, John Cusiak, who did the music for this documentary. What was it like teaming up with another uh, Arlington resident? Have you, do you go back a ways with him, or? Yeah, John and I go back to, um, gosh, mid-1980s, I think, in terms of collaborating. He's done the music for a lot of my films. He's a wonderful composer, and I'm lucky to get him. He, he's gotten very busy, so I was, I'm always glad when he can squeeze me into his busy schedule. But yeah, he's wonderfully inventive, and he, no matter what the subject of the film is, he finds a way to kind of give it a, a musical signature. This just aired last month, so the question is, what's next? Right now, we're, and have been for a while, working on a documentary about Edgar Allan Poe called Edgar Allan Poe Buried Alive, and that'll be on PBS uh, probably in about a year and a half. Eric, thank you very much for joining us today. It was Thanks, a pleasure, Damon. and best Appreciate of luck with that. It. Thank you. Arlingtonian Pat Connaughton has been an outstanding baseball and basketball player at Notre Dame University. On the occasion of his graduation, APN caught up with Connaughton to discuss his roots and his plans for the future. I'm Damon Turbot for Arlington Public News, and I'm joined today by a former star of the Notre Dame basketball and baseball teams. He was drafted by the Baltimore Orioles in the fourth round of the MLB draft last June, and may hear his name called at the NBA draft this June. He is also Arlington's own. He is Pat Connaughton. Pat, thank you so much for joining us today. You were in March Madness, the really the biggest stage in pretty much all of college sports. You won the toughest conference tournament in all of college basketball in the ACC, then made it all the way to the Elite Eight, just barely fell in a tough matchup, but you made Kentucky, who was undefeated at the time, look like they were a beatable team. Was that un un unlike any experience you've ever had before? Yeah, it definitely was. I think uh, what's most interesting about it is you don't really realize it while you're in the thick of things. Um, you know, while you're in that March run, whether it's the ACC tournament, whether it's March Madness, uh, you know, you're focused on the next game, you're focused on the next play, whatever it may be. You don't think about it from an outside perspective. So uh, it was really cool to, you know, once everything was over, uh, even though it ended in an unfortunate way for us, uh, you know, to look back and be like, wow, we were, we were part of something pretty special and, and we did some, you know, good things, uh, you know, for Notre Dame and, and for the hometowns that we represent. Talk a little bit about how playing basketball in Arlington might have uh, shaped the way you play today. You seem to play with uh, an edge to you. Yeah, I think for, for me, you know, growing up playing at Fidelity House, it was something that uh, you're in a small gym, but, uh, you know, there's so much gym time that you can take advantage of. And so working hard was something that they instilled in me at a very young age. And then, you know, as, we, uh, as I grew up and uh, we played against the Roxbury's, the Lawrence's of the world, where, you know, they were renowned for their basketball, um, you were always the underdog. You were the team that wanted to, you know, come in and do something that uh, not, no past Arlington and or Fidelity House teams had been able to do. So, uh, you know, that instilled the underdog role, that instilled the, you know, uh, defy odds role that uh, has really played a major part in my life, not just, you know, at the younger kids level, not just at the high school level, not just at the college level now, uh, trying to do it at the professional level. Expand a little bit more upon that. What is it like now that you've come back after all of that's gone on? You got drafted to the MLB last year. Now you may be drafted to two different professional sports, and you're just stepping back to the place you used to walk the streets as as a kid. What, is it, what does it feel like? Uh, it feels awesome. It, it's funny as, uh, you know, I, I never really think about it. Every time I'm back here, every time I'm back home, which, you know, wasn't often in the past four years being so busy out of school, uh, you know, I kind of just walk around like it's a, it's a normal thing. I could just walk around as if uh, I was, you know, back 12, 13 years old. You know, when I did, that's my favorite part about being back in, in Arlington is, you know, seeing the familiar sights, seeing the familiar houses, the places I grew up, places I grew up, you know, playing with, um, you know, the heartbreak and the success that, you know, you have as a young kid kind of builds who you are and, 
you know, to be put back into it and to be able to, you know, um, shoot for one of my dreams of being drafted into the NBA in this hometown by working out is something that, uh, you know, I, I couldn't have written a better script for. Pat, that's all the time I have for you. Thank you very much. And the NBA draft will be held on June 25th and aired on ESPN. So make sure you can watch and see if Arlington's own Pat Connaughton will be playing in the association next year. Again, for Arlington Public News, I'm Damon Turbin. APN attended Rock for Relay on Saturday, April 25th. The event is a music fundraiser for the American Cancer Society and was created by Danny Bianchi, a young cancer survivor who wants to make a difference. For more information about Danny and the bands and artists who performed at the event, please visit rockforrelay.com. Such a great event, Michelle, and an inspiring story, and then you got the good music as well. Absolutely, and it's great. You know, we got to see Danny's story last week, so it's great to come full circle and, and see this wonderful event that he throws. It's tremendous. Arlington Public News is a production of Arlington Community Media and functions as a gateway for local participation in issues and events of interest to the community. Check out our latest segments on the web at news.acmi.tv and like us on Facebook. Join us next time for another edition of Arlington Public News. I'm James Milan. And I'm Michelle Marino. See you next time.